on both sides of the conversation, family. We welcome you to this virtual space crafted especially for you. My name is Jada Curry, and I'm both sides of the conversation's marketing director and graphics design specialist. I want to take some time to ground us all as a community into this space we are about to open up in, so let's go through our community standards. Both sides of the conversation is providing a safe and honest space for open conversation, so we ask that you all be respectful of that. We also ask that you be respectful of each panelist, host, and participant. We do encourage healthy debates and conversations. Don't personalize anything with anyone. This includes name calling, bullying, trolling, or shaming. This will not be allowed or tolerated. Your perspective is yours. It is not a prescription. You do not have to agree, but show respect. These community standards apply to all of our live shows and any virtual spaces that we hold on social media, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We wanna make sure that we are caring for each other as a community. This is our priority in all of our endeavors as both sides of the conversation. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed today's show and continue to stay in touch with us via YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or all of them. All right, thank you for listening and see you soon. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Both Sides of the Conversation. I'm John Henry, Executive Director. Today is Thursday. You guys know what that means. We're going to have another Educational Thursday presentation. Today, we have a phenomenal, phenomenal guest that is coming back when it was COVID. He was up here breaking down all of the information, giving our community information we need during COVID. And now he is back to talk about something very important in our community that's impacting us, the monkeypox, the MPX that is going around our community. Um, I know folks are having a lot of questions and concern about monkeypox. And today we have a phenomenal, phenomenal guest that's going to talk about all of it and answer your questions. But with that being said, I want to introduce our lovely co-host today, Pretty Tony, is back in action. What's up, Pretty Tony? What's up, John? Hi, community. I'm your co-host, Tony Rochelle. It feels good to be back. I hate when I have to miss you guys because I feel like I'm missing out on important information. But I'm back and I'm ready to have some conversations. And welcome to the new people. This may be your first time watching this platform. Thank you for tapping in with us. We here. This is our platform, but community. This is your platform. So keep tapping in with us because we're doing some amazing things around the community. But like John said, today is Thursday. It's our education Thursday show, and we're here to educate you. Don't worry about how I just said education because I think that was the internet that tried to hate on me. But that's how it go. That's how it go. It's not a perfect platform, but we make sure we keep you informed. Right, John? I thought you said edumacation. I was about to That's say, why you, you, came in, you came in real hood today, huh? Okay. <laughs> that was the internet. It's hot <laughs> outside, y'all. I know, it everybody. Yeah, hot. definitely. It's been very, very hot community. I know in San Francisco, it's cooling down. But across the Bay Area and the East Bay, it is still cooking. There are still rolling blackouts happening. Please check on your loved ones. Check on the elders of the community. And make sure they're staying hydrated. As you all know, this weather has been beating up the community. Also, with that being said, because of this hot weather, our water reserves are getting tighter and tighter. Community, you all in California know we are suffering with a shortage of water. Please do your part to conserve water. Slow down on watering your grass or washing your car. Anything that you can help conserve water. Um this upcoming rest of this week in the East Bay, especially with it being 100 degrees still in the East Bay, uh, we want to make sure that we keep our water services on for community. Um, as you all know, we have a number of elders and people with special needs that need to have their water. And uh, we all as community folks have to do our part to take less showers to save this water because we are in a severe drought. And with these high temperatures, it is even getting worse. So do your part, community. And, um, you know, help out. That's what we do in solidarity. We make sure we take care of each other. Also, uh, before I get into the world announcements, I um, just want to say thank you to the community for the continuous um, 
you know, texts and emails, uplifting my family. Um, as you all know, this tragic uh, killing of my cousin that took place this weekend is just rippling, taking a part of our community. I um, mean, there has been a number of more gun violence in our community over the last 24 hours. We have young folks on life support. We have, I mean, it's just terrible right now. Um, a couple of young uh, folks um, that we've worked with in the community. I just found out today, one of the young men passed away. So again, uh, the things that are happening in our community right now are not good. And we just need all of our community families and, and, and friends and community folks to just take a minute, grab a young person, show them some love, you know, open up your mouth and say something. Right now, this is tough times. A lot of families are being impacted from this gun violence in our community. We're going to continue to do our part here at Both Sides of the Conversation to continue to work with our community, work with our young folks. We're going to continue to go to the juve jail, work with them, um, but it's going to take us all. And again, nobody in our community is exempt from this gun violence. If you're in one of these cities, you know how it goes. And um, that's why we all need to be in line in solidarity because we don't want this to happen to your family, but it's going to take us all to do this work. So just happy uh, to be here again. Again, it's been a tough week. Um, you know, it's just, it's been a lot for me um, and I'm trying to hang in there. And I just, you know, like I said, thank you to everybody. Um, you know, this weekend is going to be the year anniversary of my mom passing away. So it's just been a lot for my family, a lot for me, um, but we're going to still be here. We're going to continue to do the work and uh, we're not going to let these obstacles stop us from uniting as a community, uplifting each other in the community, no matter what they say, no matter what's going on, we are still going to stand in solidarity against the violence. And uh, we're going to work together as a community. So we're going to continue to unite. And you're going to hear <clears throat> more from us here at Both Sides of Conversation that we, as we continue to be impactful in our community. We continue to work with other community folks to put a stop to this gun violence. A lot of work to do, um, but we're going to do it. Also today, um, coming out of England, as everybody heard or may have not heard, Queen Elizabeth passed away today. Um, you know, it's been a long time. Um, she's been holding the power over there. And, um, you know, as they say, sometimes our elders in the community have to pass the torch um, before the end of their life expectancy. And sometimes they don't. But hopefully uh, it'll be some new ideals, some new uh, thought processes and things that will be taking place. And uh, we hope and pray for those families as well. We just hope to see uh, what comes out of the UK in the future. Um, so we'll be paying attention to see what, what's happening with that and um, what's going on. And we'll keep you all posted with that. Also, Credit Karma. OK, they have to pay their users up to three million dollars for false promises of be for pre-approved credit cards and um, credit checks. Um, one of the largest uh, credit card is one of the largest uh, pre-approved credit card companies. Um, they was uh, later turned down by the Federal Trade Commission um, as people complained. And um, they found out that they was uh, wasting consumers time and damaging their credit scores. Um, so hopefully some. Uh, justice comes back to those folks who've been impacted by that. Um, great to see some things is happening. And again, it is terrible when these corporations come together and try to take advantage of folks in the community. And we know majority of those folks who uh, were hit by this uh, were black and brown folks. And again, you know, just unfortunate, but glad to see some kind of um, retribution out of this. And uh, we're going to keep everybody updated as more information is coming down. There was a number of other uh, companies like that who's been impacted. And um, they'll be settling out, I guess, soon as well, since this one has went through. And hopefully some of these folks get back some of the funding and things that um, took place um, with their credit information. Also, Dr. Uh, Fauci is saying that the COVID-19 shot will likely become a yearly vaccination, just like a flu shot. I know a lot of people had was asking about that early in the year, um, but the way things is going, this COVID is still moving around in our community, there's di different um, variants. So be on the lookout, more information is going to be coming. And I'm sure Dr. Scott might be able to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, but yes, they are saying that it's, it's very likely um, that this COVID-19 shot or that booster shot will become a yearly uh, shot just like the flu shot. So I know a lot of people was concerned about it. A lot of people had those questions. Um, so now I guess that information is really starting to run down out to community. Also, some great news uh, for California fast food workers. They can see a pay increase up to $22 an hour here in California. On Monday, Gavin Newsom signed 
off a law that would create a, a board that would oversee various aspects of the in-state fast food industry, including wages, protections, uh, working conditions, and more. The law would put a cap on minimum wage, increasing that food chains with more than 100 restaurants at $22 an hour start next year. Phenomenal news for those workers, okay? A lot of times those folks that are working in those fast food restaurants have to deal with so much and underpaid. But what that means is our Happy Meals are going to go up. Our burgers are going to go up. Everybody that loves fast food, there's going to be a huge increase in the fast food. No more four for four, y'all, at Wendy's. <laughs> no more four for four. Oh, it's, no. It's definitely going to happen. So, um, you know, great for those workers. Um, as you all know, this wage gap um, of, of wage disparity here in California has tremendously impacted uh, um, all of our industries. And um, the cost of living is really pushing everybody into this frenzy. Um, but again, every time things go up, there's going to be additional costs uh, to the folks um, paying, paying for those services. So, um, you know, great to see it, but uh, it's definitely going to cost us in the pockets. Um, with that, I'm going to have Ms. Tony go over our community events. And then we're going to get started and bring up Mr. Powerful, 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 Dr. Hyman Scott. Go ahead, Tony. That's great news about the fast food industry. I'm happy to hear that, especially for California people. But hey, community, again, if this is your first time viewing this platform, we like to give out the community events. We have the 15th Annual Abundant Life Health Ministry Network gathering. It will be a virtual show September 10th. Um, the registration is right here on the board. Please um, attend that if you can. And then we also have a San Francisco community cleanup sat, um, Saturday, September the 10th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. That will be at Kennedy Allen Stairs at 4949 Mission Street across from Safeway. For more information, please call 415-769-5115. And then we're going to move it over to the Fillmore Jazz Ambassadors. Saturday, September the 10th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. And that will be at the African American Art and Coach culture complex at 762 Fulton Street, San Francisco, California. The 2022 um, OMI Mid-Autumn Festival, this will be free to the public community Sunday, September the 11th from 2 p.m. to 4 at 650 Capitol Avenue, San Francisco, California. We also have the 23rd annual UCAN HBCU Historical Black College Recruitment Fair. Oh, this is amazing, guys. Monday, September the 12th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And that's San Francisco City Hall. Um, go ahead and click the link right here to get your reservation at eventbrite.com. And then we have San Francisco African American Advisor Community Policy. Monday, September the 12th from 5.30 p.m. To register, the link is right here on the screen. And then we have the Bayview Safety Swim and Splash. It's an eight-week session. Y'all know they always talk about Black people can't um, swim, so get your kids over there because they're going to have an eight-week session starting September the 12th from November the 4th at the San Francisco Recreation and Park Department at MLK Junior Pool at 5703. Third Street, and that's in San Francisco, California. Educating the Black Child 2022 Professional Development Series, Wednesday, September the 14th. For more information, please visit this website right here to get all the information you need. Then we have the Bayview Street Talk, addressing historical transportation neglections, Wednesday, September the 14th, and Friday, September the 16th from 5 p.m. to 6.30. And that would also be in San Francisco, California. And we also have an RSVP website where you can um, RSVP your spot. The Bubba Goal, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. The Bubba, the Bubba Goal. Bubba Goal. Bubba Goal. Robot Sterner Wrapping Workshop. Sounds interesting, community. I don't know. I might have it's to It's the go strut. There. It, you know, the people that be strutting, they be doing the strutting oh, in the movie. They be strutting. The moment? Okay. <laughs> yes. Pretty Tony may have to be in the building. That would be Wednesday, September the 14th and September 21st, as well as September 28th from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the Bayview Opera House. 
4505 3rd Street, San Francisco, California. We still trying to get these babies prepared to get back to school. So back to school Thursday, September the 15th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And that will be at the Leoa Harville, Harvard Early, Early Educational Center. For more information, please call 415-252-2500. And then we bring in the Jazz in the Garden, which is free to the public Sunday, September the 18th from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. The Brotherhood Mini, Mini Park next to 319 Head Street, San Francisco, California. Uh-oh, here goes a good one, a good one. Uh, oh my, Roller Skate Party, Saturday, September 24th from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. And that is 289 Fallon Street between um i don't know how to pronounce that. Capital. Could, thank you uh zobert at capital in san francisco california for more information please contact maurice rivers at 415-729-3658 and then we have the taste of ex exoneration family fun local food music and art i think i did not pronounce that right uh it, it sells here it sells here Excelsior. See, that's why you got to have a host here to have your back. Thank you, John Harry. Saturday, September 24th from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. And that would be also in San Francisco, California. The address is located on the screen right here. The Harlem of West, the San Francisco Fillmore Jazz era, era 1940s, when I was not thought about, in 1950s, um, Saturday, September 24th. From 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., special jazz guests. Hmm, I wonder if Robert Glasper is going to be there. Quality of Life, Festival and Advocacy Day, September 22nd and September 24th at 2500 Independent Avenue in Washington, D.C. For more information, please visit the website that's displayed on the screen. Um, the Pan Can Presents Blue Ribbon Car Show, September um, Saturday, September 24th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that will be held at 727 Nelson Rising Lane in San Francisco, California. Um, please visit, please register um, at this location that's displayed on our screen. And then we have the 2022-2023 second annual kindergarten kit. Get a box of educational and enrichment support. To receive your free box, please sign up. The link is right here on the screen, or you could text 415-859-5176 for more questions. And then we have the San Francisco Smart Money Coaching. We all can use that. Free, con free, con <clears throat> free consolation, financial guidance for anyone living, working, or receiving services in San Francisco. To schedule an appointment, please call 1-877-256-0073. If you missed any of the information that I said because I was pronouncing things wrong, please check our uh, website. Please go to our um, subscribe to our newsletter as well as uh, follow us on all social media platforms. Both sides of the conversation, we're always looking for volunteers. Our work is inspiring and it feels good community. We make a difference in the community and the results show. We are highly driven group with high impact. We get the right things done at the right way. Not only will you be contributing to the community, but you will also learn a lot and gain knowledge in your field of interest within the organization. We value your ideas and your inputs. Sign up to be a volunteer today. You can make a difference. So the, support both sides of the conversation while you shop at online at Amazon Smiles. Donation is 0.5% of your, your purchases on Amazon to both sides of the conversation. All you need to do is start your shopping at smiles.amazon.com and choose both sides of the conversation as your charity organization. And donations will be made at no extra cost to you. Like I said earlier, go to all of our social media sites for more news on how to give back to community and support both sides of the conversations. This is not the only show that we provide to you, community. We have a, our upcoming show, which is Sunday, September the 11th at 4 p.m., which is one of our favorite shows because the youth will be present. And we love to hear from our future leaders. 
We our next show will be our hidden gem show, which is Tuesday, September the 13th at 7 p.m. For those of you that don't know what a hidden gem is, every Tuesday, if you know someone that you would like to highlight in the community that's doing amazing things, please, please nominate them to come on our show. Or maybe that's just you. You can sign up too and be a guest of our show. We would love to have you. With that being said, that's all of our announcements community. Um, if you missed anything, like I said, please visit our sites and get ready for an amazing educational Thursday show. Back to you, John Henry. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony. Enough of us. Y'all have heard enough about us. A lot of announcements, a lot of things going on in the community. That's always a great thing. As we came out of this COVID, folks are trying to get out and, and back to socializing and networking. So great to see all these events. Thank you to all the community organizations that are putting these events together and getting it out for our community. But with that being said, the man of the hour that is here to educate our community. Y'all know every Thursday, our goal is to bring information, education, awareness to our community intentionally. We, we try to do this intentionally. As you all know, the monkeypox, MPX, they've changed it from monkeypox to MPX, have been a threat to our community. It has impacted our community. A lot of community folks are having all these questions. And tonight, a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal presenter is here tonight. Not only is he a part of the Department of Public Health, he's doing stuff at UCSF. He's part of the HIV team. He's doing so many things. He's a part of the community. And guess what, y'all? Not only is he a doctor, he looked just like us. Oh, but that being said, I'm going to bring up tonight's guest, Dr. Scott. Welcome back. Phenomenal to have you here. And um, just looking forward to tonight's presentation and all the amazing information that you're going to be able to give to community um, because they've been asking about this monkeypox. And uh, hopefully tonight you will be able to break down everything that they need to know. Thank you, John Henry. I definitely appreciate your uh, invitation to come in and talk again about monkeypox and or MPX, um, previously known as monkeypox, um, and just give a sort of update to the community around uh, what we um, know about MPX, where um, where we think MPX is going, and who it's impacting. There's also a lot of information about the vaccines, um, and there's a there's uh, treatments that are available as well. So. Um, John Henry, are my slides visible? Yep, there we go. We're putting them up there. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, all right. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, do a sort of a presentation. I really would love to hear questions if folks have them about um, about MPX, um, about things that you, you may have uh, heard, things that you may want to um, know that I, I don't touch on today that really you know, this is around answering questions that you might have um, and sort of giving you an update on, um, on what we what we know about MPX and what we don't. So um, I pull this every time I give a talk and this circle in the middle of the United States continues to grow. And now for probably the last month, the United States has been the world epicenter of MPX. This used to be a um, mostly outside of the US, predominantly in Europe. Um, but as you can see, it's now spread all over the world. And in blue is where it's endemic. So this is where we have had MPX cases since like the 1960s, 1970s. Um, but everything in sort of orange is, <clears throat> is places where we don't usually have diagnoses. Um, and the, the US is the world epicenter. So we now have over 56,000 cases um, as of yesterday. Um, in the US, uh, there are about 21,000 cases um, and 4,000 of those cases are in California. California has the largest number of cases of uh, any state um, in the US. Um, so we are the epicenter in the epicenter of, uh, of MPX, um, which is why it's important that we all know about it. Um, and most, uh, but not all the people diagnosed uh, um, identify as, um, men who have sex with men, cisgender individuals who identify as male and were assigned male sex at birth, um, who also have sex with, with men. Um, one of the things that I think had been a concern from the very beginning was um, like many uh, new uh, diseases and some of the old ones, um, that they often follow the lines of, um, 
of disparities in income and social determinants of health. And so from the beginning, we were concerned that this was going to negatively uh, have a negative, more negative impact among Black and Latinx individuals in the United States. And unfortunately, that's exactly what we're seeing. So um, the uh, Centers for Disease Control Prevention does now report on the race, ethnicity by week of MPX cases in the US. And the majority of cases, over 67%, um, I updated this uh, last week and it was 65, 65%, um, so it continues to rise, um, are among Black or Latinx individuals. And if you look at these bars, um, in the beginning, um, I think a lot of this was actually a by who could have access to testing. So most of the cases were among uh, individuals who identify as white. Um, however, that blue bar has continued to decline. Um, and now the green bar are, um, Latin, are Latinx individuals or Latino Hispanic. You can see that bar has expanded. Um, but the bar that is expanding the most um, and now represents the largest proportion um, of cases are among Black African Americans in the U.S. So um, <clears throat> we're not sure uh, how much more this is going to expand, but if we look at uh, other um, sort of transmittable diseases, in particular things like um, STDs and HIV, um, if it follows the same trajectory that those other um, conditions do, then we anticipate that this will either continue if not worsen. Um, and this is a vaccine preventable disease, which I will talk about. Um, so we need vaccines to get to the people who need it most. And um, it's not clear that that's been happening. In San Francisco, these are the cases um, uh, among San Franciscans. Um, and you can see that it's, it's a different uh, de uh, epidemiology or demographics of cases compared to what we see um, nationally. San Francisco has a, a, a smaller Black population than the U.S. overall. Um, but so it's about 6% of, of the cases are among Black African Americans. Um, about 28% are among Hispanic Latinx individuals. Um, and so that is more in line with what we see nationally. And about 45% are among white individuals. Um, you can see the breakdown is also among um, cisgender men is, um, is the predominant uh, group that's impacted. Um, and this is mostly gay, lesbian, or same gender loving individuals, um, where we have still about a, a quarter who declined to answer that question. So one of the things that um, I also we also monitor is uh, is wastewater. And I like to show this slide because it gives us a snapshot of what's happening in our communities, independent of what's uh, testing availability. So it might look like like cases are changing. But it might just be that people are having more trouble getting tested. And we saw this with COVID. Um, and so this wastewater uh, sampling has been very useful in sort of getting a better picture of what's happening in our communities overall. So two places in San Francisco where we, uh, where we sample wastewater and they report this out. Um, it's available on the website at the bottom. Um, and you can see in um, quite a reassuring way in San Francisco at this point is that we've seen declining cases among um, a San Francisco residents, um, and you can see that there's some uh, bouncing around of the cases in one of the sites, um, but a more steady decline um, in one of the other sites. So we've seen a, a spike in in late July um, at both these sites, and a, a steady decline um, since since then. Um, and so we have concerns about what might be driving spikes, um, particularly large um, events like Pride, like Folsom, or sorry, like Dory Alley which happened at the end of July, um, and then um, Folsom Fair, Street Fair is coming up next. Um, and so we really wanna make sure we get people vaccinated. So um, before I get into some more things about monkeypox, I wanna get a little bit of background of what monkeypox is, um, or MPX is. It's a, it's a virus that's very similar to smallpox. Um, and so smallpox, as you may have heard, we eradicated in the um, late 1970s, early 80s. Um, and so people who are born before that time period, um, both in the U.S. and uh, internationally, um, were uh, vaccinated against smallpox because it was a very deadly disease. Um, there are other members of the um, sort of that family of poxes, and they all, most of them have animal names. So there's a lot of questions about why it's called mon uh, monkeypox, which we now refer to as MPX. But there is a cowpox and a camelpox and a horsepox and a 
raccoon pox and a skunk pox. These are just the animals that these were identified in. Um, and cowpox actually gave us the pathway to develop a vaccine for um, for smallpox. And so that's sort of where where these um, names come from. And MPX is is much less deadly uh, than smallpox in general. Um, and we are seeing that in this um, in this outbreak as well. So where did this name come from? Um, and so um, this virus lives mostly in rodents, but it was first discovered um, like uh, some of the other viruses that carry animal names in the animals in which they manifested first and were noticed. So uh, monkeys at a research colony in the 1950s um, developed this infection and developed lesions, classic for it. And so that's why this was named monkeypox because it was first identified in monkeys in this uh, research colony. Um, and you know m many of these live in um, in in uh, rodents, um, so like cowpox. Um, even though it infects cows, it, it actually lives mostly in, in rodents. Um, and so um, this is uh, how it got its name. And um, this is a little bit of a history about what we know about um, MPX compared to smallpox. Um, and so we identified it, it was identified in the late 1950s. And then as we uh, got to a point where we eradicated um, smallpox, uh, we stopped vaccinating in the US in 1972 and globally in 1980. Um, but we were seeing cases of MPX um, in uh, parts of Central Africa, um, in the DRC um, in the 1970s. Um, and as I mentioned in 1980s, uh, 1980 smallpox was still declared eradicated. Um, we did see more MPX cases um, in the 80s during that uh, after smallpox was eradicated. Um, and then there in the late 19, mid to uh, late 1990s, there was an outbreak again in the DRC. This is where on that map that I showed where those blue dots were, where it's been endemic um, or sort of has been circulating for many years. Um, and there was more than 500 cases that were thought to have happened there. Um, this is after, you know, 10, 15 years after we stopped giving people vaccines. Um, and so uh, we, we felt like there, there likely was some uh, waning of the protection that people had against smallpox, which um, also provided some protection against MPX. Um, in 2003, there was an outbreak in the U.S. in Wisconsin, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then there was a traveler in Texas that was diagnosed with MPX um, in, in 2021. And then now we have this much larger outbreak, which I sort of described the scope of we've never seen before. So in 2003, um, this is more uh, uh, emblematic of what we saw with prior outbreaks. Um, so this was uh, 72 cases. Um, we actually didn't see human to human transmission. There were no deaths. And this is actually from um, prairie dogs that were being uh, that were being sold in pet stores. Um, and it was people who uh, were, had contact with these prairie dogs. And so uh, we don't have MPX in the US, um, so where did they get it from? And it does appear that they were kept next to this uh, rat that was imported um, through the pet trade and that rat as the reservoir for MPX transmitted it to the prairie dogs who then transmitted it to humans, but the humans weren't transmitting it to each other. Um, so uh, this is like what we usually saw. These sort of um, uh, sort of went away on their own because there wasn't ongoing transmission. Um, so it was relatively limited in scope at 72 cases. So we have a lot of differences now. So we have a lot more cases. Um, in the past, it was mostly from animals to humans. Now it's from human to human. Um, in the past, it was like this just sort of was in Wisconsin. So it didn't it spread outside of you know, a single state, but this is global. So this is now in, you know, almost every continent, I think, except Antarctica. Um, and it is, you know, lots of cases all over the world. Um, and in the, in the prior outbreaks, generally the rash would start on the face, but in this outbreak, it appears that it's starting more on the genitals um, or anal areas. Um, and there's not always a prodrome of a fever and chills that um, per, um, usually happens with, with uh, MPX. And um, we haven't really seen many deaths uh, with this um, with this outbreak. It was about 10% in prior outbreaks, even though there wasn't one, any deaths in the 2003 outbreak. Um, 
and um, you know these these deaths are are pretty rare dis, uh, in light of how many cases we've seen. So MPX, this is what it looks like. So generally, after somebody is exposed, they have what's called an incubation period, a time from exposure to the time they develop symptoms, and it's about a week. Um, it can be as short as three days, um, and it can be as long as uh, seven. Um, generally, it's about five to 21 days is sort of the range we tell people. But we've definitely diagnosed people who've been exposed, um, you know, within three days um, after the exposure. Generally, um, they have what we call a prodrome. Um, and if you look at this list of symptoms, it sounds just like COVID. So most people will um, develop these symptoms and then test themselves for COVID or get tested for COVID. Um, so it's very nonspecific and it can be quite mild. So just feeling a little tired uh, might be a symptom um, if somebody's had an exposure. And then a rash develops, um, usually a couple of days after the fever um, or other prodrome symptoms. And it's usually painful and it goes through a progression um, in the way that they look. Um, and they look like a lot of other things. So people are, in, particularly early on, like didn't know what it was. And so um, people were being told they didn't have MPX, they, you know, that this was something else like herpes or syphilis, um, but it actually turned out to be um, MPX. Um, and there's one classic component of it. It has often a little dimple in the middle of it. So um, if there's a lesion or, or um, a bump or sore, that has a, a, a sort of dimple in the middle of it, um, which we call umbilicated, that is actually um, pretty classic um, for MPX. Um, and as I mentioned, um, this outbreak has looked quite different than previous um, outbreaks. This is not a sexually transmitted disease, even though it is uh, transmitted during the skin to skin contact that happens during sex. So we wanna be clear that this is um, in some ways behaving like an STI, but this does not require sex to be transmitted or it's not like a sexually transmitted disease. If somebody has a lesion on their skin and you come in contact with it, you've been exposed to MPX, um, even if there's no sex. Um, one of the things we're seeing also with this outbreak is um, proctitis or inflammation or pain in the um, rectum. Generally, um, if somebody has had an exposure at that site, um, and it, it's actually caused quite a bit of uh, complications, sometimes actually requiring hospitalization. So this is um, uh, the, the timeline of what happens with, with, MP, with MPX. So in this incubation period, so before somebody has symptoms, they're not considered to be infectious. However, the moment they develop these prodrome symptoms, they can be infectious and they have identified um, the virus in saliva, in semen, in um, uh, in urine, um, in addition to the skin lesions. So um, you know there are there are people who, as I said, don't have necessarily skin to skin contact, but you know uh, kissing is another. Um, uh, sorry, don't have sexual contact with somebody with MPX, um, but you know kissing with somebody who has a prodrome, um, you know, could potentially transmit it. So we want to be very clear that you know this is impacting certain communities right now, but the way that this is spread, it could easily, um, you know, expand beyond that community. Um, so this is sort of what happens with the virus. So generally um, when somebody develops this rash, um, they um, have sort of this redness that, that happens uh, that can be everywhere on their body. It can also be on their um, hands. It looks a lot like syphilis. Um, and then that sort of progresses um, to more vesicles, um, which can look more like uh, like herpes. Um, and then they can sometimes uh, have a little pus under them um, and have a little dimple in the middle um, that looks also a little bit like her like herpes, but can also look like other um, skin infections. And then usually after about one to two weeks, um, those scab over. Um, and then it takes a couple more days for that scab to completely heal and new skin to form underneath it. However, it can sometimes look just like pretty benign otherwise. Um, like if you look at these examples, there's not a lot of redness um, with these in particular in the top um, on the hands uh, and the shoulder. So um, you can see here in particular, there's like a little dimple. So that's a pretty uh, classic. This one actually doesn't have a dimple on it. 
um, might be at a different stage. And then um, you can also see this uh, rash here with sort of areas that are in different stages. So these lesions can pop up over time um, and they sort of progress at different rates. Um, so uh, there's a lot of questions about like, how is this transmitted? Um, and one of the ways that we know it's transmitted is to animal to, to human, um, but um, we also now know that this is like human to human. Um, so touching the lesions in particular, there's a lot of discussion about skin to skin contact. And yes, that's true. However, that skin has to have lesions on it for there to be transmission. So if you, um, you know, touch somebody on the BART or on Muni or at the gym and they don't have lesions on their body part that you touch, um, if for, for example, somebody only has lesions in their genital areas um, and you like touch them or shake their hand and they don't have lesions on their hands, like you're not going to get MPX that way. Um, so um, there's also droplets that can, um, uh, that can be a cause of transmission. And this is um, similar to what we have with the flu because the virus can live in the, um, live in the, um, in the saliva um, in sort of nasal pharyngeal area. <clears throat> and there's less and less um, evidence that this is airborne. So unlike COVID, um, there's a lot of comparisons to COVID. And I think COVID is another recent virus that we have all dealt with. Um, however, this is very different in the way that it's both transmitted, how long we've known about it, and the fact that we already have a treatment and a vaccine for this um, is it, are things that are very different um, compared with COVID. So there's less and less evidence that there's um, airborne transmission of, um, of MPX. I think there was a concern initially when this uh, outbreak started, but I think the data have supported that this is not really a way that is transmitted. So I'm gonna skip through this a little bit, but I just wanna um, highlight that, you know, if somebody is a contact or um, in a group that's experiencing high cases, um, and has a rash that you know monkey MPX should be high on the the different high on the list of things it could be, and that really we want to get that person tested um, and swabbed. So I've had to help many patients navigate this process. It's gotten better in San Francisco, but I think it's still difficult in some other places to get people tested and to not be brushed off and not be dismissed um, because that's going to delay a diagnosis. It's going to delay um, somebody getting evaluated for treatment if it's indicated, and that there can be progression into very complicated um, complications from having this infection. So if somebody has a rash with this outbreak that's now going on and has one of these criteria um, within the last three weeks, you know, then they, they should be swabbed. And, and if they're if needed, you can reach out to me and I can help figure out how that person can, can get a swab. We have many places um, now that are, that are doing that. Um, but, you know, the, the way we diagnose it is with the rash at this point. So if somebody doesn't have a rash, that's not really MPX that we're worried about. Um, and then there's, there's a couple of things about post-exposure prophylaxis, and now we're doing pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk mostly about the vaccines. So there are actually two vaccines for um, that, that are used for MPX. So one is so it's ACAM2000, not ACAM200, um, which is a live virus that replicates in the skin um, and it's given um, and it sort of replicates in the skin and cause a little scar. So you'll see individuals who have the smallpox vaccine, for example, they have a little scar on their um, shoulder. Um, and if somebody is born after 1980, they probably don't have, and they have a scar, they probably haven't had smallpox vaccine unless they've been in the military because the BCG, which is a tuberculosis vaccine, also causes a little bit of a scar. Um, so most people under the age of 50 have not received um, the smallpox uh, vaccine. Genios is the current one that's available. It's a live virus that doesn't replicate. Um, and so it doesn't sort of um, replicate in the skin. So that's why it's given as two doses and the ACAM2000 is given in one. Um, it um, has a low, thought to have a lower risk of uh, complications um, and to be a sort of a, a easier uh, vaccine to, to tolerate. Um, and there is um, this risk of myopericarditis or inflammation of the area of the heart, the lining of the heart that, um, that we know happens with ACAM2000. Um, the Genios vaccine, we, 
we don't have all of the, um, we, we haven't had MPX or smallpox um, outbreaks to, to test this um, to vaccine. Um, so it's been approved because they compared people who received the Genios to the ACAM 2000 and looked at their immune responses and how much antibody they developed um, and they were comparable. So um, it produces a similar antibody to ACAM 2000, which we have used in areas where um, smallpox was um, being, uh, was circulating. So there are two ways that the uh, uh, Genios vaccine can be um, administered. One is a subcutaneous. Um, so on the left, it's generally in the back of the arm and not actually in the shoulder, but it's a short needle that goes in between the layers of the skin and the muscle. Um, so this yellow area here is a sub-Q tissue. It's between the skin layer and then your muscle. Um, and that dose is 0.5 uh, ml. So that's a, um, a larger dose that goes in this bigger space. Um, and <clears throat> the, the virus doesn't replicate, but it triggers your immune system to uh, develop a response antibodies. And then that's how you stay protected. It's given twice. Um, and we're we've been delaying the second dose in, in uh, our jurisdiction here in San Francisco um, until recently. And now we're offering the second dose for anyone. It's given 28 days later. Um, and um, it can cause some redness. It can cause some uh, pain at the site, um, and um, and generally uh, quite well tolerated. The alternative, or um, this is an intradermal injection. This is a emergency use authorization that the Food and Drug Administration gave based on some studies that compared this uh, administration intradermal to subcutaneous, and. Um, instead of going in the yellow area, which is a sub-Q tissue area, it goes in between the layers of the skin. So if you've ever received a TB test, this is how it, that's administered. It sort of sits in between the epidermis and the dermis, um, and it creates a little wheel right under the um, skin. That is, you have a lot of immune cells that sort of exist in that area because their job is to you know, run interference if you get an infection or get exposed to an infection. So by placing the vaccine there, you can get a bigger immune response with less of the vaccine. So that's why the dose is lower. So um, there's all this discussion about its dose. It's the low dose. This is actually not the low dose. This is the correct dose. Um, it should be lower because you don't need as much. Um, and, and so that causes, uh, again, it can cause a, um, an inf uh, inflammation or redness as the immune system is being activated. So um, that's a little bit about intradermal. So most of the vaccines are being administered now are intradermal. Um, in each vial of the vaccine, um, the Genius vaccine, um, which is given subcutaneously, you can actually get up to five doses of intradermal. So we uh, quintuple the number of people that we can vaccinate and we have, we've been short on vaccines, unfortunately. So I'm sure they'll have uh, folks have questions about that. So I'm going to run through treatment quickly. I think I only have a couple more slides, and then um, be happy to take any questions. Um, so there are a few uh, there are a few treatment options. I would say that the main one that we're using is this ST246, also known as TPOX. Um, it is available through the CDC um, through uh, an expanded use. Um, investigational new drug. So there's a bunch of process that the provider has to do in order to be able to access the medication. It's not like they can just get it through their pharmacy. Um, and it we've been using it and we have, I think, four or five sites in San Francisco that are using it. Um, and it does seem to be making a difference and people no longer start developing symptoms when they, or sorry, new lesions when they start it. Um, it uh, appears to be quite well tolerated. Um, it's taken for 14 days. Um, so if, if somebody is in San Francisco and needs access, you know, we have a few places. I put a few links um, that are sort of uh, in the banner um, that can uh, have information so people can access treatment. Um, and then I just um, want to talk a bit about stigma. So I think that there's been this um, desire to change monkeypox name, as we've done locally to MPX um, <coughs> as or MPOX to um, to de try to destigmatize it, um, given the, the communities that it's impacting right now. And I think like other things, this is um, got potential to spread 
you know, to, to anyone. This can be spread through skin to skin contact. It is not, you know, that it's not, a, it's not just based on somebody's uh, sexual activity or um, sexual orientation or um, community identification. Um, and so we want to be careful because we have seen this with HIV. Um, we've seen this with COVID um, that this can undermine our ability to respond to it. Um, and it will put all of us it, at a, in the worst position if we don't approach this in the ways that will be based on how um, how this infection spreads and um, how we can prevent it from spreading more and getting people vaccinated and um, talking about it in a language that doesn't stigmatize individuals, um, that makes them not want to either seek treatment, seek testing, talk to their partners, um, talk to their family members, um, and actually be able to get the care that they deserve from providers when they might have symptoms that are consistent with it. So I'm going to stop there. I have some references if folks want them. Um, but I would love to take any questions that folks have um, about this. I saw a few in the chat, but I don't know, John Henry, um, if you want to. I, I mean, people just saying, you know, um, you know, we needed this topic. As I, I told you, we needed this topic. Um, you know, a lot of people are afraid when they hear you talking about this stuff. And I, I think you did a great job of like, you know, clarifying a couple of questions that I had. You actually uh, clarified it in there. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you, because, you know, up at UCSF, you know, with the macaque monkeys, you know, we talk about, um, you know, the herpio and different things of that nature. Is that process for cleaning those, um, you know, when you come in contact, is that the same process that they're using for the MPX or is it a different process? Like when it, when it comes to the cleaning time, the washing time, and then the different, um, you know, treatments of um, that they use if you come in contact with, uh, you know, one of the macaque monkeys. Oh, you mean, um, so, you know, we, that was something, so especially in the research areas um, now, you know, those, those, like, we don't think that this spread through that process. So what we think happened is that somebody was in an endemic area in Southern, in Central Africa, and likely acquired MPX there and then um, traveled outside of that area to Europe. And then there were contacts that happened there that uh, eventually sort of spread it more uh, widely. And then there were a variety of uh, large events that occurred. Like I said, we've seen these spikes around the large events that we've had locally. And there were a bunch of festivals that were happening. And that's actually where they started to see them initially were sort of in these festivals in Spain. Um, and then people were traveling um, to France and to Britain and they were seeing them sort of breaking out. Um, and so what we're seeing in the US is exactly what sort of they experienced in Europe and that it, it appeared to be imported from um, somebody who had been in an endemic area and then traveled um, you know, to Europe initially. And then you know, people are back to going about travel and, and everything. So that we have these potential for this to happen. Wow. Go ahead, Sakati. You have a question? John Henry, I got a bunch of questions. <laughs> so one of the things that I did pay attention to, because, um, uh, you know, I'm kind of a conspiracy theorist at thought thinker sometimes, uh, simply because I pay attention to certain things that other people don't look at. Um, what I'm noticing is, though, is that, A, when uh, COVID came out, they wanted to blame it on Chinese people. Then as monkeypox started getting a little more prevalent, they wanted to blame it on the LGBTQ community. Um, and I commend any whoever it was who said, let's make this impox or what have you. I, I'm so thankful for that because I don't want my brothers and sisters or however someone identifies, I don't want them to become a target because someone gave this a name and then said, oh, well, this is, you know, being seen in the LGBTQ community, which I think is absurd, but okay. So my question to you is, A, why is it that every time there is a, a big disease, it's always uh, labeled to Africa? And then after we look at that, my other question is, I'm a person who is neutropenic and I had a past brain trauma and I already don't trust doctors. Why would I get a vaccination? Those are my two questions right now. Yeah, so, um, so I think that we, um, 
we should, I like to sort of think about like, what is the information that we have and where do, what do we know and what do we communicate? So, you know, I think that we should really, I, we try to sort of approach this and we'll provide the information to individuals that they have it and then they can make their own decisions and own um, assessments of what it is they believe, what they don't believe, uh, what parts of it they think are trustworthy and particularly the source. So, you know, I think that from, uh, you know, looking at other diseases that have originated in, um, in, uh, in Africa, mostly actually in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and, you know, do we have the scientific evidence to support that, you know, this might have been um, where that originated? We do have that for other diseases that um, sort of are more in South, in South America. So, um, you know, Zika, um, we have Chagas disease. There are other diseases, yellow fever, like there are other diseases that exist in other parts uh, of the world that have spread. Um, more globally as well. So it's not just in Sub-Saharan Africa that disease is spread. Um, and, you know, we've, we, and honestly, I think, you know, we've known about NPX, you know, for a very long time, right? So since the 1950s, and, you know, we haven't done anything about it. So I think that there's another element of that. So we knew that it was there um, and it was circulating and we could have done some of the testing, for example, um, of some of these other things um, like vaccines um, based on our knowledge that it was uh, circulating there. But I think that it was sort of a neglected disease. I'm an infectious disease doctor. We have a lot of these that are sort of out, you know, that are existing in the world. And it is when they explode into Western, you know, countries, that's when it gets the attention, the resources and, and such. And the last um, question I forgot to ask you, doctor, yeah. Did I cut you off? I apologize. No, no, no. I had another thing I wanted to say, particularly about LGBTQ. Um, and 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 my my comment is that I think early on that there was such a concern for stigma that people were not giving the right information. And I think that there was like, oh, we don't want to stigmatize, you know, LGBTQ folks. And you're doing it to the point where you're not giving them the right information so they can respond. I think that the response to MPX was too slow. And not and not wide enough, and I think that that was part of it because you know I heard about this. I was like, I think the I think gay people want to know if this is something that is spreading within their community, so they can make a decision about what they want to do and what they don't want to do. And so I think we have to be. Um, it's yes and yes, it can be stigmatizing, and we need to get people the information, and then we need to figure out what's the best solution for it. Um, because we are we are several months behind where we could have been, um, in particular before Pride season kicked off, and whether or not people had the appetite for, um, for you know focusing on that in that kind of way that I think folks are focused now. I'm not sure, given that we were coming out of COVID, um, but we should not take that choice away from people. And I think mm -hmm. that that's kind of what happened. And I think in retrospect, we did everyone a disservice by by treading on eggshells a little too much. Mm -hmm. So I guess my other question for you then is um, for those who are afraid of a shot, is there a sublingual form of this, um, as we would call it antidote since it, <laughs> to make it sound a little bit jazzier, but is there anything that could be sublingual buccal um, for anyone who is afraid to get a shot or so uh, basal? Um, unfortunately, we do not, we don't have options other than the, um, the intradermal or subcutaneous. So I think you're referencing, so influenza, for example, the flu shot, they actually have a flu mist, which is a nasal. Um, but for people who are, but that's actually a live replicating virus. Um, so it can actually, for people who are immunosuppressed, we actually don't recommend that virus, that vaccine. Um, so no, we don't currently have a, um, there are other vaccines that are oral. Those are mostly live replicating vaccines. Um, but right now it's just the, the shot. So it's more like what we have for, you know, most of our other vaccines, which are given sort of in the sub Q and the muscle. Tony, did you have a question on this? Yeah, this is scary. I mean, what advice would you give to parents? Because, you know, I have two little ones that I have to send to school every day. And I mean, 
what is the girl to do? I mean, you're gonna worry all the time when you send your child when your kids out school outside of your home. So I think you know, thankfully, right now we are not really seeing this spread through um, you know school age children. Mm -hmm. um, so when when I get asked that by parents, I say the best thing that we can do is to help advocate that we get the control of this before it spreads outside and into larger communities. So if we can end this outbreak, then you don't have to worry about it. And the way we end it is by making sure we get people access to testing and vaccines and treatment. And, um, you know, and that's that we know that works. Um, that is how we sort of addressed other outbreaks. Um, so I think that's where, I, you know, I really think that there's an element of, of advocacy. I think that um, we haven't had these conversations around like black and brown people that this is impacting. Um, it's now the majority of people impacted in the United States, which is the epicenter of the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, staying engaged with that conversation, I think is is really important. No, definitely. I mean, that's huge stuff. I mean, you know, one of the concerns, because you said California was one of the largest hit um, states uh, across the country. Um, you know, here in San Francisco, I mean, I'm glad you touched on that about the stigma because we're trying to do our part to do the outreach, talking to folks about getting checked. Um, but I'm glad you're here to really educate and break it down to community folks, because a lot of times in our community, that stigma, um, you know, of it being a, a, a LTBGQ uh, disease and things of that nature. When you look at the numbers and you present it, it shows it, it's impacting, you know, that community the hardest. There's a tendency in our black and brown community to say, well, hey, see the numbers? This is not us, it's them. And 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 I'm glad you came because it's like, we have to change that narrative. And I wanted to, to ask you, you know, how does that correlate with, you know, when the HIV AIDS epidemic, it was kind of the same thing. Are you seeing that same kind of like motion in the community where folks are kind of like, hey, you know, this is not me, this is them. And and, and we want to avoid that that big explosion of, like you said, impacting a, a larger community. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's definitely been, um, you know, not a like rush to this rush to the table discussion um, around this. But I think people are are. People are like responsive to that when we're talking when we're talking about it because I think that you know you know the invitations haven't been made either um, and I think we need to be explicit and and um, intentional in making sure that we are like telling folks that this is something that is in our communities that it is impacting you know members of our community we see the numbers we see the proportions um, and that you know we have a collective response ability to respond to this um, outbreak um, because we know where it's going because we have examples in the recent and current situations about what is going to happen and that's kind of what i also remind people is like it's not you know it's like it's pretty predictable and you know it and we're seeing that play out in ways that are unfortunate Wow, great stuff. Um, you know, one of the things, um, you know, because you are part of the um, Department of Public Health um, in our community, like just say in D10, for instance, um, you know, what are the service ramp ups looking like? You know, are you at that point as a, a, a department saying, hey, we see these numbers, like you said, we can see where it's going. How prepared are we to like move forward um, with like how we did with COVID, setting up testing sites in the community. Um, how do we meet our community folks where they at? You know, we got folks who, um, because of a number of our community issues, can't move around freely. How do we continue to get that support, um, testing, vaccination, um, supporting the community? Is there a plan? Um, is that something that you all are strategizing? How do we get those services in our community? Yeah, and yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the response to COVID because I think that that was really a partnership. Right, like it, it wasn't the it wasn't you know any organization, including DPH, is going in and saying this is what we're going to do. It was conversation within the community about where and what and how it would be done, and it was done collaboratively. And I think that's where we are with NPX is we're working with community members and community organizations um, to support um, you know vaccination within um, particular community sites, community organizations um and you know testing as well 
um, and pop up vaccination clinics if, if necessary. So I think that's really the approach that we learned. We, you know, I think we learned a lot of lessons during COVID. I don't think we made the necessary changes after COVID to make it a better response. Um, but I do think that one of the things that uh, was learned and I think internalized was a community um, partnerships in sort of how we respond um, to, to, to all, you know, all these outbreaks. Wow. Yeah, definitely very important stuff. I mean, you know, it is definitely challenging um, when you come to the Black community. I mean, we struggled so long with COVID um, that it took, you know, people a lot of time to kind of get to those services and check it out as it becomes more real for whatever reason in our community, we are not the preventive folks. And that's what I'm trying to change with this gun violence. How do we get our folks to be preventive? You know, we're more reactionary. And I mean, we got to change that in the black community. Um, and we've seen it with COVID as it upticked, you know, folks started losing family members and things close to them. Then it was like this big panic to get there. Then we ran out of supplies and things of that nature. Um, but strategically, um, you know, this is going to move and continue to move. I know you said there was a slowing um, because of the large gatherings. Um, but, you know, somebody had texted me and was asking to ask this question because they couldn't ask the question. You know, those the bumps looks more like uh, boils from burns. Um, is there uh, um, a way that someone early on as is what type of signs would they see, Dr. Uh, mm -hmm. Scott? I mean, it, like, right. You, we know once you can see it, but is there like any kind of symptoms that a person can, is it like maybe, you know, irritation early? How would they know to go and get checked? Right. We know once the bumps are showing or, you, yeah. get that, you know, that, 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 that type of uh, heat rash looking, but what do you do before? What are some of those signs that maybe, maybe somebody's thinking about this and they don't know what, what kind of information you could give on the signs that, that folks should be looking out for? Yeah. So, you know, it's very, it's like, um, you know, some of the COVID type of symptoms. So it's fatigue, um, fever in particular, like if you have a fever, I wouldn't ignore it. Um, particularly if you, um, if you have had an exposure, um, uh, potentially to, to MPX. Um, and then, you know, the other symptoms can be really mild and, and a lot of times people don't have any of them. Um, and so what we're working on is trying to develop a test that doesn't require the lesion, the skin wrap, the skin uh, lesions. Um, so right now, the only way to test for it is to actually swab the lesion and send that off for testing. But it is, like I said, in other places, including saliva. So you know, developing another type of test that includes saliva, or um, you know, doing a swab of the throat or something like that, like we do for COVID, um, might be an option so that people can get tested. But yeah, I think if you have a fever, I wouldn't ignore it. If your COVID test is negative, for example, or you've had a potential exposure, I would sort of um, lay low for a while till you feel better. I mean, in general, we learned this during COVID is like a lot of times people were doing stuff despite having illness, being sick. So like if you're sick, stay home um, and get evaluated um, as soon as you possibly can. Um, but right now, the only way you can do testing, unfortunately, is just to swab the lesion. So on, on that swabbing part, um, you know, to say a person don't make it for whatever reason in our community, just don't go to the doctor. They don't trust the doctor. Will those will those bubbles or I hate to say like bubbles, but yeah, those, <laughs> those spots will the they really get a rash? Will they recess back into the skin or do they open up like boils when you get burned or like? You know, what happened if somebody goes untreated? Like, what's the effect? Yeah. So what will happen generally is it'll go from, like, sort of a red spot to a red blister. Um, and then it'll turn um, into, a, like, a scab. So it'll turn, like, sort of black crust on scar on top. And then that will um, eventually fall off and new skin will grow underneath it. So that's generally the progression. And that can take up to two weeks. However... We want people to stay in isolation until their last rash like heals. And so what happens is these show up over time. So you might get, somebody might get one on Monday and then have a new one that shows up three days later. So that new one has to heal completely before that person come out of isolation. So I have a patient who was in isolation for four weeks because they had so many lesions that, uh, 
that needed to heal for them to go away. But yeah, they will heal and they will sometimes uh, they'll leave us, they can sometimes leave a scar. So um, many of my patients who've had MPX have scars from the, uh, from the rashes because they cause so much damage to the skin. There's a question on the screen. I think you did kind of cover it, but if you want to just say something to that about the vaccination. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the vaccine was um, approved because it produces an immune response. And I think we, with COVID, had um, a lot of uh, research that showed it actually prevented people from getting sick from COVID. Um, we haven't, but we had a lot of COVID in the community. We had a lot of COVID everywhere. We don't have that. We didn't have that with NPX. This is brand new um, in terms of the scope. So we don't have that data on how well it prevents NPX, but it does look like it produces the immune response, which we um, we think is the way that people stay protected. Um, but we, you know, we need to be honest and say that, you know, we haven't done the studies that show that, you know, this works X per, to reduce X percent of you know, risk of acquiring COVID, or sorry, uh, MPX. Um, I will say that I think that there are two things that are driving the declining cases in San Francisco. One is vaccination. We've been very aggressive. Um, so I think we've administered over 20,000 vaccines. Um, so a lot of the people who would be indicated um, and be at risk because of um, the community that, that the community and activities that they're doing um, are getting vaccinated. Um, at least with one dose, and people have changed their behavior. Um, and I think that there needs to be um, accolades and support to the community for responding to this outbreak and changing behavior, just like COVID, right? It was vaccines, but it was also masking. It was also avoiding large place. So we have behavior change, behavior things that we can do, and we have like vaccines and treatments that we can do. So I think the community has responded amazingly well to this outbreak to reduce the number of cases to try to protect our community with that being said doc, i was just thinking about behaviors like how are you supposed to live your life like how are you supposed to date how are you supposed to fellowship with each other and be normal and also not worried about getting sick or even losing your life just to have to live life like you know, we, we need to talk about these kind of things because it could go both ways. Do you just lock yourself up in the house and don't exist anymore so you can stay safe? You know, or do you do you risk it? Like you you got to give me something because it's not giving me no comfort right now about life. I'm scared. Like, do I not touch the door knives? Do I just stay like this when I go out and walk like this? What do I do? Yeah, I mean, I think really thinking about it's not skin to skin. I think we need I, I think we missed an opportunity to help people like not freak out about this because it really is skin to lesion. Like if, if you touch somebody's skin and they don't have a like lesion on it, like you're not going to get monkey box from them um, and you're not going to get from a doorknob. Um, you know, there, there are, you know, in households where somebody might share a towel or um like other utensils or something like that recently that might be a way because it's in saliva and if they have lesions on their hand and they've touched something and you touch it afterwards um and then i think um it's an opportunity to talk about conversations like talking about people and how they're how they're feeling like if somebody's not feeling well then you know maybe you should delay that date um and um you know <laughs> talking about vaccines <laughs> So hi, yeah. this is our first day. How you doing? Do you have monkeypox? Because if you do, yeah. this is the first and last day, sir. <laughs> no, I mean you could say, you know, have you been sick in the last week? You know, because they could have COVID, right? So yeah. NPX yeah. isn't the only thing um, that you know that you should have, you know, have in the conversation piece. So I think it, I think it's changed the way that we engage with each other a bit, which I think. Um, is opening conversations that may not have happened otherwise, which I think is healthier, healthy and positive. Um, and then, you know, I think uh, talking to people and getting vaccinated. So if you're eligible to get vaccinated, I encourage you to get vaccinated. Um, we know that that is, um, this is a strategy that um, we use for almost all infectious diseases um, when we have it available. And, and we had the good fortune of those studies being done initially to have this available. Um, we didn't have enough of it. Um, and, um, you know, we don't have all the pieces that we would want, but we have a safe vaccine um, that, um, 
you know, produces a response that uh, we believe will be protective. Dr. Scott, you just gave the women out there 29 questions. They already have 25 questions on the first day. You just <laughs> gave them four. <laughs> uh, but one of the questions that I, I did want to ask you before you uh, start wrapping up here is about, you know, how COVID was in place. There were certain things like restaurants, um, different places. You couldn't go in because there was, you know, the, the signs of like COVID if you had a temperature. Um, because the MPX it can be hidden under clothes and things of that nature. Do you see any of those type of policies coming in place or like these daily screeners is just, if it's an open, okay. No, I don't think it's necessary. Like COVID is a totally different beast. Um, and yeah, you can be in the same room with somebody and get COVID. You're not going to get MPX just being in the same room with somebody. I mean, it depends on what you're doing in that room, but if you're just in the room, you know, you know, if you're just in the room talking to somebody else, like you're not going to get MTX that way. All right. um, the other question I get is like, you know, oh, can I get this from the gym? Is somebody using gym equipment? Um, and, you know, we don't, this is something that is really like if somebody has lesions on their body and yes, they leave like, you know, sores and stuff like that, and they flew it on the machine, but that's not generally what happened at the gym. Um, and so just brushing up against somebody at the gym or using a machine after somebody is not something that, you know. So you mean I still got to check my mail and pay the bills that's coming? I thought yeah. it was going to be like anthrax. You remember when we weren't allowed to check the mail and all that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, you, I mean, you can decide not to check it, but just don't blame MPS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, well, other, one other thing, I guess, Tony, kids, I mean, so that being said, kids playing with kids having contact is very less likely, is, is what you're saying there. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, um, if you think, like many of us who uh, grew up in the area where our friends had chicken pox, and then our parents send us over there, so we would get chicken pox as kids, so we wouldn't get it as adults. So, you know, that is spreading around through children. So that's why the parents were like very proactive in sort of increasing the number of transmissions by having you go. So, you know, we're not seeing this in children. So yeah, I think if kids had, um, you know, if this, if this had in, become present in schools and among kids, then yeah, you would see, you see transmission because kids touch everything with each other, but we're not, you know, thankfully right now, and we want to keep it that way. We want to prevent it. So we need to focus on where it's happening and what we know works to try to prevent it from spreading and hopefully completely eradicate this outbreak. That's really our goal. So I appreciate so the clarity around the kids because I was already telling my kids, don't touch this. Wear gloves. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't. <laughs> because that, that I know that for me as a parent and a lot of other parents I know, we were like, do we even send our kids back to school when school started? because we had this impression like that's where they were saying that it was coming from. So it's a lot of mis miscommunication about this, this, you know, this, do I call it a disease or what do it's I call a disease. it? It's a disease, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a lot of um, mis mis miscommunication about this disease. And um, this is why we need to stay up on the, the, the new statistics of what to do or how to, to take care of, protect our loved ones because it's, it's, it's scary. So doctor, I think um, just from what I'm hearing you say, um, and I, I really loved your presentation that answered like a million and 50 questions. My mom's been asking me, she's a, um, she's, she, she's like, nope, I got to put the news on. I got something about monkey pox. So <laughs> I'm like, lady, I'm gonna talk to you tomorrow then. So um, hopefully she jumped on because I asked her to watch. She's had a million mm -hmm. questions, like I said. But I think um, like with most things, um, learning how to properly wash your hands. Oh, see, here she goes. That's my mom right there. Oh, I, hi, mom. You see what I'm saying? The, the lady, she, she, she got questions. <laughs> but I guess for me, it's um, most people don't know how, how their kids should properly wash their hands or how we as adults should properly wash our hands. Hand sanitizer is not the know-all be-all. We're just giving germs baths. So if you're going to use a sanitizer, wipe your hands off right after you use it so that you can remove the germs from your skin is what I was taught. And that's what I do. Um, so I guess what I'm asking you is, do you think that it's very um, essential for us to teach our children and also ourselves how to properly wash our hands and how to um, teach our kids to keep their hands out of their faces, 
and away from the nose or what have you and learn to wash their hands regularly? Yeah, you know, um, as an infectious disease doctor, our, our, the, you know, we spend so much time trying to get everyone to wash their hands at all. Um, and it's just hard, like behavior change is hard. And I think COVID has given a new uh, motivation for people to wash their hands. And I think I like the fact that you focused on like, wash your hands with soap and water. So we ran out of, you know, early on, everyone is running to get Purell, but you look at like the soap aisle, there was plenty of soap there. Um, and so washing your hands with soap and water. And yeah, you know, there's CDC has some guidance on like how to do it properly um, and, you know, uh, completely. But yeah, I think washing your hands is, is a big part of, of things. And it would help in so many other things. Like we also still have colds that circulate every season. We have flu that circulates every season. Um, there's other things that washing your hands is helpful for. Dr. Scott, I think we need to put a class for the adults first, because I'm going to tell you right yeah. now, I'm in the men's bathroom all the time. Doctors, researchers, students, these folks do not wash their hands good enough. We should put an adult class. I think the kids do a better job than the adults. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. Yeah, because they get more uh, feedback from the adults around them. And there's a lot of nasty women in the world, too, doctor. Believe it or not, they be fine as heck on the outside, but dirty hands on the inside. And mm -hmm. I'm not even playing with you. So be cautious. Oh, no, I believe it. It's not, that's, that's not just, that's not unique to, uh, to men. Um, there's a question about uh, how we know if it's chicken pox, um, if it looks the same in children. You know, I think that that's a good question. If that happens, um, you know, if there's a child that has a rash, um, you know, I think talking to their provider and, and communicating with their provider, they, they can test the the rash. Um, um, so I think that's that probably my best recommendation. Um, if somebody has a rash that looks like like it looks like um, lesions on it, um, to have the provider evaluate them. Yeah, and Dr. Scott, so there's no signs right now that MPX have caused fatalities or from their um, effects or anything of that nature. So it's not like- well, I think that there are some deaths from MPX. I don't think there are very many. It's not 10% like we had seen in prior outbreaks, but um, yeah, there are some, and the complications can can get quite severe, um, particularly if somebody gets lesions like in, in like the GI system or in the rectum. Wow. Well, I'm not going to hold you up anymore, Dr. Scott. You've been here long and um, wow, this has been very informative community. I hope you all, for the folks who will tune in later to watch, because uh, I know it's Thursday night football. I know it's opening night, um, but folks that, that's that been having those burning questions, I hope when they go back and look at the replay um, that all those questions have been answered. You did a phenomenal job presenting tonight. I think 40% of the questions that I had was answered right in your PowerPoint. And that's how it works. And that's the kind of communication and information that we need in our community. Um, and again, it's just great to have you here. One, somebody who looks like us, because for whatever reason in our community, um, if they don't look like us, sometimes they don't want to believe um, that is real. Um, but um, thank you just for being here in space and definitely um, looking forward um, to having you back to have a conversation about HIV AIDS. I know there's a lot of different um disease work that you do. And I know HIV is kind of one of your specialties and one of the um, areas you also highlight. Um, I think that's a conversation that we need to really continue in our black and brown community um, because during COVID there was a spike and increase um, that really wasn't being talked about much uh, because of COVID overpowered that. And I think we need to refocus and bring that conversation back to community and let people know that, hey, this is still real. It is still impacting our community. I mean, I know research and some of the things have taken place over the year. Um, I remember reading something that they even have a pill now for HIV that is kind of like showing great signs and different things of that nature. Um, but we'd love to have you come back, present, and then get a panel of folks to talk about their life experience living with HIV and just also having that conversation. I think our young people really need to hear this conversation. Um, I know I, I was on a call with DPH. The STI numbers went up during COVID. Um, there's a big spread of gonorrhea and syphilis in our community. And that just goes to show that some of our young folks and folks in the community are still not being protective, not doing the right things to get tested 
And um, definitely we would like you to come back and help facilitate one of those conversations with community. And then anything else that you feel um, our community should be aware of and they should have the information and knowledge to do it because, uh, man, that PowerPoint you put on today was on point. And I'm sure with some of the other work that you're doing, uh, we'll be able to really help some of those questions in our community. Um, that's what we're about here, trying to bring that education and awareness to our community with this information that sometimes our community just don't get. There's a lot of um, CBO meetings. There's a lot of times that meetings happen with other folks in the community. And they're always asking us, John, could you bring those people that's in those meetings to the community? And uh, we just thank you again for being uh, open and uh, being that pillar of the community, want to make sure that our community gets the right information. And uh, we just appreciate um, all of that and, and, and what you bring to our community. So with that being said, you know, every show before we let our guests go, we get them an opportunity, one, to give a shout out to anybody they want to give a shout out to, any departments or any part of words that you really want to leave with the community before we close out today's show. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I just really want to... Um just leave a comment that we have an opportunity to change what usually happens with MPX. And it doesn't have to happen the way that it appears to be going and that it's going to take uh, a rapid, intentional and aggressive action in order to do that. And like coming from the community is always the way that that's happened. Um, and so that's why I, say yes whenever i'm asked because i know that this is how we get to the result of like if i'm happy in my role if nothing happens like and that's really what i want is like nothing else to happen and that's going to take a lot of work um and so but it can't be done without the community driving um driving it too great stuff community the information is up there on the screen um, there's a lot of ways you can find out more about MPX. Please do your part, do your research, go out and check um, information. And um, definitely we're going to continue to do our part to continue to bring these type of presentations to our community. We've heard from you. Great information. And um, I hope we have uh, at least started to equip ourselves in community to make sure um, that our communities are safe and that we are doing the things that we need to do. And this was great prevention tools. Again, our model, when we talk about changing the narrative in our community, that's what we're trying to do here at both sides of the conversation is change the narrative. What people typically say happens in our community, we're trying to change that. And it starts with these type of presentations. It starts with these powerful folks here that give their life and dedication to making sure that we are kept safe. There's a lot more work that we have to do, um, but we have to continue to work together, be open to listen and not just say, I don't want to hear it. This is not for me. Sometimes you have to, like he said, take a little bit of responsibility, sit back, listen, and, um, you know, hopefully you make the right de decision so that we don't further impact folks in our community. But with that being said, Tony and Sakati, if y'all have any parting words, please do it now before we close out tonight's segment. Yeah. Uh, I oh, go ahead, Sakati. Oh, sorry. You know, um, I'm very thankful for this. Like I said, my mom is watching and I wanted her to watch because I'd rather her hear it from someone who looks like us, someone who has a vested interest in our communities and someone who, um, this is your job. This is what you do. This is not what you think because you have MD after your name, but this is what you do daily. So hats off to you. I commend you on the work that you've been doing. I was all in your business the last few days, looking at all your research, just being nosy, you know, not minding my own self business. I was all in your business. So I want to say hats off to you for your tireless work, your research, because, you know, you have my heart with research because I research. So hats off to you. Keep doing the phenomenal job that you were doing and continue to bless our communities with your knowledge, your wisdom and understanding of you know, everything that you do, because it, it all starts with the virus. And and you got that down, brother. So I'm, I'm proud of you that you family now. So if they messing with you, they messing with me. So uh, I look to see you in person and shake your hand and give you a hug. Um, but this today, you, you've 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 embraced our community like no other. Um, this is my favorite show today. Thank you for what you've done. And, and it's it's a miracle because 
I've been wanting to know. And when John said this, what we were doing, I was like, yes. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Thank you. Yeah, I second that. Um, thank you for coming on this platform and looking like you are and the color of your skin, because it is very comforting um, when you hear something from people that look like you. Um, and thank you for giving comfort so I can take it back to my network of parents <laughs> so we can say, go outside, go outside and stay outside, kids. OK, go play with each other. You know, so thank you, doctor. And um, keep bringing the information here. But community, wash your hands. Get rid of the sanitizer. Get the soap in the water. Okay. We need a protest. Y'all know how we do in the town. We got to put signs everywhere to remind each other, have conversations. And it might be uncomfortable and embarrassing, but we trying to stay alive, community. We want to be here for our kids and generations to come. So we got to get cleaner. We got to start cleaning it up. So thank you again for coming on this platform. And we look forward to having you back. Definitely, definitely. Very powerful stuff. This is why we choose this Thursday and every Thursday for our Educational Thursday, where we give phenomenal individuals in our community an opportunity to come and do a PowerPoint presentation and break down the questions to help our community have a better understanding and make sure that we get the information that sometimes we don't get in our community for whatever reason that might be. But today you are blessed. We have the best here. Dr. Scott representing uh, the San Francisco Department of Public Health, UCF, and just all the amazing work that he's doing for community and community organizations. Again, it is great to get information straight from community mouth, someone who looks like us. And I hope this helped you, comfort you, and gave you enough awareness now to make a sound decision. I hope if you have symptoms, you would do the right thing and go get checked and make sure that you are not a part of the problem, but part of the solution. So thank you all again for being here. I know folks is enjoying their football. But there is still real community work that has to continue to happen in our community as we address gun violence, mental health, and a number of issues that continue to impact our black and brown communities. We will be a part of the conversation. We'll do our part to make sure that we get the right people at the table, the right people on this platform to continue to empower and to move our community forward because that's what we will continue to do change the narrative. And as Tony always say, we're just going to keep ascending community and we're going to move our community forward. So thank you again for tuning in tonight. Be safe out there. Do your part. Okay. Less showers, slow down the water uses while we're going through this heat wave. We want to make sure that our elders and the folks that are vulnerable in our community don't have to go through water outs or blackouts. So do your part and be responsible. Again, we have to be in solidarity on all issues that impact our community. And this heat, this drought is one of them. So let's do our part so that our other folks in the community are not impacted. Again, be safe out there, community. Have a great weekend. And we'll be seeing you all this Sunday. OK, at 4 p.m., we're going to hear from our youth. They're going to talk about what it's like being in a single family home, what it's like having both parents in the home, how that's affected them and some of the folks that they know and what those relationships look like. You guys always talk about John. We want to hear what the youth think. We want to know what the youth think. Tune in this Sunday and you'll hear from our youth from the community and they'll tell you how they feel on the topic of living in a house with a single parent versus living with two parents in the house. So it should be a great conversation. And then we'll follow up next Tuesday with another Hidden Gym segment where we will continue to highlight our black and brown businesses and those community leaders and organizations that are doing positive things to impact our community. This has been a great show. If you missed some of it, go back and get the information you need because Dr. Scott here gave us all of the gyms that we need to protect our family. So with that being said, have a blessed evening, be safe, and we'll see you all this Sunday. Have a great evening, community.